And welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. I'm Salvador Cordova. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, you see, I need to turn down some video, some audio, extra audio sources. I'm hearing a lot of feedback. There's always a problem that, that comes up. Uh, greetings to everyone. We have Discerner here and Peter W. And if I miss someone, I uh, hope you'll forgive me. I don't have a co-host who, who usually, what the co-host often does is to handle uh, greeting to everyone. If you're wondering why I'm wearing this, this is, I kind of try to recapitulate what it was like for me when I spoke before the Creation Research Society. I have here my official badge. There you go. There. It says research is our middle name. Uh, the Creation Research Society is not meant to, you know, their mission is uh, uh, not, not, not to have these conferences where they evangelize or anything. You know, we're all parts of Christ's body, and not everyone's going to be a missionary. I tried to point out that we have to be grateful to these many unnamed individuals that did Bible translations. They're really the unsung heroes of Christianity uh, that have served us and have uh, been important in equipping God's people to further the kingdom and to make disciples of all nations. And so, you know, creation researchers are kind of in that position. You know, we're not, you know, we're called to be witnesses of Jesus like every believer, but our specialty is to, is to do research. There are about 600 or so, 650 members of the society. Uh, and a good fraction of those are voting members. And to be a voting member, you have to have an advanced degree, that is a master's or PhD. And even though we're a small society, we're having a, an impact that's disproportional to our size. But even, you know, four or 500 researchers is pretty impressive. And some of these people are on faculty of both secular and Christian colleges. They teach biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, scientific disciplines. Uh, so, so a lot of the people in the Creation Research Society have science degrees. It, it, they're not, you know, about theology and seminary. A lot of them are not professional evangelists. So this is, this is a, a research society. So on July, Saturday, um, July 23rd, I gave my address at uh, 3.15 p.m. to the Society Liberty University Lynchburg. In the audience were people like uh, the Dean of Liberty University, uh, Mark Horstemeyer. The, the day before the provost of the university came out and said, you know, we are committed to the Young Earth model, uh, six day creation. And, and he referred to the creation week. So even though Answers in Genesis is delisted un, Liberty as a young earth uh, creationist university, that was it from the provost's mouth. So I think there have been some departments that have dissented from that uh, officially, but the science faculty by and large are young earth creationists. The Dean of Engineering, Mark Horstemeyer was there. He's head of a very good engineering department. He had uh, was a very senior professor, probably a department chair at Mississippi State University. He had PhD students he'd uh, teach at Mississippi State. Uh, in the audience also was Lorianne Hamrick. Uh, used to be formerly Lorianne Dent before she got married. Uh, she was a graduate of Cornell. Uh, there are uh, other faculty member like Mark Hamrick, her husband, professor of biochemistry, and Timothy Brophy, PhD in biology from my undergrad alma mater, George Mason University. There was Rob Carter. There was uh, 
Marcus Ross, paleontologist who is a former member of the faculty at Liberty. And uh, there, are, there are others. I'm going to run out of memory here trying to name uh, all the important people there. There are people from Answers in Genesis, from Creation Ministries International, from the Institute of Creation Research. Uh, and there are people there from Cedar Hill University and other young earth creationist uh, university. So th they were represented. So this was from July 21st to 23rd. Furthermore, the next, there was an origins conference just four hours north and it started this past Monday and it's, it's completing here in Percival, Virginia. So I don't know who's at the door. Can you uh, excuse me? Get, get rid of someone. Yes? <laughs> Sorry about that. You know, I, I get these solicitors I do have to kind of just show up, you know, because I am worried some people are casing the neighborhood and they're trying to figure out who's home and not. And uh, I hated to just shut the door on him. I just had to point out that no one invited visitors. So that was that was disturbing. I mean, some people just don't read the signs that you're not supposed to do that. Um, so apologies for that. So. This is stressful because the crowd that I was speaking to is very sophisticated. It's not like the crowd on the internet that, you know, uh, the, the, some of my critics, I don't have very nice things to say about them, so I better be quiet. So now when you hear this talk, I will be referring to other, I'll be referring to other people, uh, other researchers that had spoken earlier in the day and also the day, I mean, earlier in the conference, I'll refer to specifically to like Dr. Rob Carter, who talked about 4D braided bear monology, which is kind of complicated. Uh, Dr. Horstemeyer that talked about uh, constraints, uh, multiple constraints, Andy McIntosh, Dr. Andy McIntosh, professor of thermodynamics, he related thermodynamics and information theory, origin of life. He got in a minor argument with John Baumgartner. I'm going to be addressing that in my talk because I promised I'd include that. And I might, you know, mention some other people randomly. So you'll actually, you know, on the drive home and afterward, it was replaying in my mind the whole talk. I remember some of the people, you know, with questions and answer, you know, the answers I was trying to give. Um, so <clears throat> I, I, no, I was, I was referring to the critics, Seamus, not, um, not to you guys. There, there's a certain, there's a certain crowd that they know who I'm referring to. It's not you, Seamus, but um, th there was, uh, and there's uh, Dr. Dr. Marcus Ross in the audience. So, um, I'm going to now shortly proceed. Uh, I'm going to try to just almost read from the, the, the script. And you'll see me kind of look to the side here because that's where I have my slideshow. So uh, let me try to get this set up. And all right. <clears throat> see if I could share it now. I'm going to share screen. Let's share it with audio. Hope the audio is coming through. Uh, I will be sharing a video. Let me 
let me see if I can get this to be maximized here. Okay. All right. Okay, let's let's start. Let's go, Brandon. Let me hide this here. It's a little obnoxious. Once upon a time, there was a young man named Matt Bill Yu. He was raised in a Christian home, but by his, uh, by his time in high school, he had renounced the Christian faith. He went off to college to study biology. And by his fourth year, as he pondered the complexity of the cell, he realized that a naturalistic evolutionary process did not create life. It had to be the product of a miraculous work of God. Shortly thereafter, he recommitted and rededicated his life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, went off to seminary, and is now a defender of the Christian faith. I point this out to highlight the value, the spiritual value of studying the cell. Studying the cell. We'll do that a little bit today as we consider the protein orchards. And, uh, you know, Matt Bill, you studied the intricacies of the cell. We'll study it today through the protein orchards. This is, uh, this diagram represents what is called the tree of life, sometimes called Darwin's tree of life. It depicts the, the evolutionary viewpoint, the traditional evolutionary viewpoint, uh, albeit not exclusive viewpoint, that all life today and as represented in the fossil record emerged through a process of descent with modification from a single, single-celled prokaryotic-like creature that diversified into the life forms we see today. So you see this, we call it, we sometimes call this a phylogenetic tree, this kind of tree-like structure, and I will refer to, I'll, I'll refer to the tree-like structure today. I, I sometimes, on the internet, we sometimes kid evolutionists that, uh, you know, if, if, if they're all related like this, then if you're a squirrel and you're munching on a strawberry, you're eating one of your distant cousins. And so this morning I found this little picture of a squirrel eating on a strawberry. I thought it was kind of cute. In contrast, what about the parts of life, specifically the protein parts of life, such as these represented by these proteins here, can they be unified by a single universal tree? I will argue that they cannot be, and I will provide evidence to that effect. Even evolutionary biologists, uh, to my astonishment, agreed with me that it, it, is more, uh, it is more accurate to say that the proteins of life, the protein parts of life have independent common ancestry, have independent ancestry. And just so you know that I'm not out in left field, I have a videotape of Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, Rutgers University evolutionary biologist. Uh, he is, some of you know who he is. He is the nemesis of Nathaniel Jensen and James Carter and others. But here, uh, I just have him on record and let me play what he has to say. Give you a chance, yeah. I agree. No, but you you definitely, it seems like you represented my views very accurately, uh, which is that there is definitely not one single common ancestor protein that every protein that we see is descended from. You have multiple independent things yeah. appearing and, at different times. And that's interesting. Just so you know that you heard it right, let me play it again. Just give you a chance, yeah. I agree. No, but you you definitely, it seems like you represented my views very accurately, uh, which is that there is definitely not one single common ancestor protein that every protein that we see is descended from. You have multiple independent things yeah. appearing and, and, at different times. And that's interesting. So we could just finish right there. The evolutionists agree with me. Uh, his views, Dr. Cardinal's views, agree with, uh, there are a few papers on this, not many, 
And we could also go into stuff like the, the databases like Uniprot CDD, Sparkle CDART, and the use of position-specific scoring matrices. We don't need to go into all those painful details of bioinformatics, but the title of the talk was Bioinformatics has unwittingly adopted the idea of a protein orchard. So let's just move on and not get bogged down into bioinformatic details. So evolutionary biologists then have this viewpoint where all life emerged from a single life form, generally, and yet the parts of life have independent origins. Intuitively, creationists will sense this seems like kind of a disconnect. Creationists would prefer what we have referred to as the orchard model, where uh, it's independent origins all the way down. Now, Dr. Carter, Dr. Rob Carter, in his talk yesterday, uh, made this, you know, it, it's more subtle than that. He had this braided bear monology. I have, uh, it, this isn't, doesn't exactly reflect his view, but this is close enough, close enough approximation um, to the point I'm trying to make. So this is a catchphrase to hold on to for this talk. Geometry is priority. Geometry is priority. And the basic idea, you can kind of uh, see it here. Uh, let's just think about this conceptual phylogenetic tree where we take the original car made by Carl Benz of Mercedes Benz fame in 1886 and seek how conceptually with kind of quote unquote descent with modification, it diversified into the variety of cars we have today. You can generate this tree of similarity and it's a conceptual, we have a conceptual ancestor, not a physical one where there's inheritance but there's descent with modification. And you, you, you could see this relationship because the basic geometry is preserved. There's, there's an element of basic geometry. Just for grins, the car on the upper left-hand corner is Danica Patrick's GoDaddy car. And on the right is, drag, is a dragster. And I really like dragsters. That's neither here nor there. The question that arises, and this relates to the topic at hand, can we hypothesize, even conceptually, even conceptually, could there be a car part from which all the other car parts could descend in this family tree? And the answer is no. There's no conceptual, we can't even conceive of an ancestor in principle that could be, uh, that would have a shared geometry with a fuel tank, a tire, a piston, a spark plug, a radiator, or battery. In contrast, we could take the architecture of a battery and we could make a family tree like that for like a, for a particular part, but for all the parts as a whole, you cannot make a, you cannot unify them under a tree. This problem extends to the, to, to the protein families, the major protein families. It's a problem of geometry. And just for your information, going left to right, some of the proteins represented here. I represented some of the proteins in life. Uh, the zinc finger protein, the homohexameric helicase, a potassium ion channel, a homodimeric topoisomerase 2, an insulin receptor, and, and a heterotrimeric collagen. Let's take, let's look at the geometry of a potassium ion channel. Uh, that's a Richardson ribbon representation. And here's another Richardson ribbon representation of that channel. Just look at the geometry of this God made part. It resembles something of a man made part in terms of geometry. That's just kind of for grins, just to get you thinking. One of the reasons that proteins, as a matter of principle, should have independent origins is a problem of all or nothing functionality. Uh, it sort of has to appear whole uh, in the history of life for it to work. And so let's just consider a radiator. It connects to, a, to, to the engine. It has to have piping that connects it to the engine so that it can draw out hot water from the engine. 
move the hot water through the heat exchanger, cool it off and, send, and pump the cold water back into the engine. It's not gonna be worth much as a system if it can't do that. In evolutionary theory, they have to say it has to be evolutionary selected for to, uh, um, to eventually be incorporated into the, into the population, but a, a half functioning system is not gonna be selected. So therefore it's a dead end. It has to appear, it has to be all or nothing. Uh, there is the issue of co-option. Don't have time to cover it in detail. It is a complex. So the idea of all or nothing is similar to Behe's irreducible complexity and one of the criticisms of irreducible complexity had to do with co-option, but particularly for, for a protein co-opting parts of other genes, this is very difficult. So if we have, if we have multiple genes that have pieces of function and then it has to be stitched together into one gene to, to code for the protein, that's very difficult from a probabilistic standpoint. Uh, one would not expect that this should happen natu naturally. And I, up there is a citation of evolution of promain, uh, protein domain promiscuity in eukaryotes. Uh, it was co-authored by my professor at the NIH, Igor Rogozin, who uh, was a staff member to one of the top evolutionary biologists on the planet, Eugene Kunin. And he highlights this problem and this conundrum and that's also where I got the idea. This is a problem, and I just, you know, I, I have to mention it for completeness. And these are diagrams related to that. Uh, th we can talk about that, obviously, in, in another venue at another time. But speaking of all or nothing function, let's take a biological example. Consider the topoisomerase 2 uh, in, in humans. It is a target of chemotherapies um, for cancer cells. So if, if you're able to disrupt, if a chemotherapy is able to disrupt the functioning topoisomerase in a cancer cell, it'll kill the cell. Unfortunately, since chemotherapies are not very specific, they get into healthy cells and kill the healthy cells too. That's why people often get very, very sick when they're under chemotherapy. Let me take this time to acknowledge my co-author, Professor Joe DeWeese, Professor of Biochemistry at Fried Hardeman University and also the Vanderbilt School of Medicine. He uh, did a lot of work on topoisomerase and contributed to this presentation today because of his expertise in topoisomerases. I had the honor and privilege of co-authoring an article with him in the CRS Quarterly in 2019. And Joe DeWeese is also a top researcher. He's a young earth creationist, but also a top researcher in the secular world on topoisomerases. He published in the number one science journal in the world, Nature, in 2010. I had the privilege of publishing with him in, in the journal for the Federation of American Societies of Molecular, of, uh, Experimental Biology in 2019 and also in 2021. I'm pleased to announce we have a, uh, we have been accepted uh, pending reformatting uh, another paper uh, that's gonna be a full research paper and it's related to some of the things I may talk about today. So now let's watch a video of uh, topoisomerase in action. Let's consider what happens as DNA unwinds during replication. As DNA unwinds, it acts like this rope when we pull apart its two strands. As you pull the strands apart, twisting tension builds up in the rest of the coiled portion. It is actually adding one twist to the remaining rope for each twist pulled out of it. At some point, you can't separate the strands anymore. The remaining rope is too tightly twisted. If you relax your tension on the rope, it will twist around itself in a supercoil. It is releasing tension. If you want to keep pulling the rope apart, you have to release the tension periodically. And one way to do this is to cut the rope and splice it back together. 
This problem has been best characterized in small circular DNAs. There are two methods of dealing with this problem in DNA. One cuts only one strand of the DNA double helix, and the other cuts both strands. Let's look at the first. Topoisomerase 1 enzymes cut a single strand of the double helix, pass the other strand through the cut, and reseal the break, relaxing the overwound molecule, which now has one fewer twist. Topoisomerase 2 enzymes do the same thing but with both strands of the double helix. Topoisomerase 2 cuts both strands of a double stranded DNA and passes another double strand through the break and then reseals the break. So, if a molecule of DNA is supercoiled, topoisomerase 2 can remove the supercoiling two twists at a time to yield a relaxed circle. Let us praise God for his marvelous works. Amen. So this is again a, a Richardson ribbon representation of the topoisomerase 2. And it does look like a pair, it resembles a pair of scissors because it does cut. So now let's consider the, the all or nothing aspects of this topoisomerase 2. If the hypothetical ancestor of topoisomerase is a, all it can do is cut, but not reconnect or untangle, it's going to basically kill the cell, or, or at least definitely all the lineages. So that's a dead end. It's not going to evolve any further. Um, it's not going to evolve piecemeal, as Richard Dawkins would claim. Uh, or if it could just reconnect but not cut or untangle, that'll, that won't work. Or untangle but never cut and reconnect in the first place, that's not going to work. So all these are dead ends. It has to be all or nothing functionality. And some people will say, well, there are these endonucleases. The problem with invoking that is that there's still, if it's not all in one protein, there has to be a compensating system somewhere else in the cell. So the endonuclease will, will cut, but there's something else that will help reconnect. So the problem doesn't go away. It just gets moved elsewhere. And uh, let, let's, let's move forward here. So that's, a, again, illustrating the all or nothing problem. There are other problems that would uh, force us to conclude that there's independent ancestry. It's the problem of evolving one geometry to another. So even conceptually with this bolt, Trying to evolve it into a functioning nut, that doesn't uh, make functional sense, uh, and vice versa, a nut into a bolt. This illustrates a problem. Survival of the fittest will prevent, prevent evolutionary change both conceptually and physically. We tend to think natural selection facilitates the evolution of new forms. It actually prevents it in many cases. And this is just an illustration. Random geometric changes to a nut will cause the nut to be a bad nut before it can become a good bolt. Therefore, it will not evolve gradually. This is known somewhat in evolutionary circles, but particularly in evolutionary computing. It is the problem of fitness landscapes where something is trapped in a fitness peak and is prevented from evolving. Only intelligence can force a design out of the trap of fitness peaks of multiple competing constraints. This is men mentioned uh, yesterday in Dr. Horstemeyer's talk, and he referenced Vilfredo Perito, who had synthesized these ideas. And there are, I'm just going to repeat a little bit of an example again uh, with some variation. A nail will evolve to be a bad nail before it can become a good wrench even if it is incrementally reasonable to transition from a nail to a wrench from the standpoint of geometry, it is not reasonable to transition from a nail to a wrench from the standpoint of functional intermediates. And this also points to another problem. What, is, what good is a wrench without a nut to apply it to? What good is a wrench without a nut to apply it to? You may have this wonderful tool, but it's not going to be of much use if there's if it's not going to be if there's nothing to work to, to apply it to. 
And so this highlights the problem of coevolution. Two separate parts can't be evolutionary, evolutionarily selected for, quote unquote, uh, unless they both exist. And there are further problems uh, that would drive us to think of independent protein ancestry. The problem of snug fitting parts. Snug fits and functioning systems imply most random geometric changes to the critical features of a system are detrimental to the system as a matter of principle. Uh, th this is just for illustration and we'll, we'll take it down to the molecular level. If we shrink the size of the bolt, it's not gonna fit in the nut anymore. Or if we, you could see that if we start changing the sizes of the parts, if we change the pitch and, and the nature of the threading, this could be just a disaster, it's gonna fall apart. So therefore, just kind of random changes to the critical sections of this system will cause failure. It's, the problem is far more acute at the molecular level where we're dealing with protein parts. This is from Essential Cell Biology by Bruce Alberts, fifth edition. It shows two proteins there, colored different shades of green, and they are shaped to connect to each other. But there's an additional constraint here where the charge distribution on one protein has to be such that it will enable it to match the other protein. And that means the positive charges on one protein are located so that they will be in proximity to the negative charges on the other protein. Since opposites attract, they're able to come together and it also helps them find their partner in the middle of a, um, a, a very randomizing soup inside the cell. And so that was a 2D illustration. Let's go to a 3D illustration using a kid's toy. This is a 3D dimensional puzzle that kids uh, can play with. You can see the, the snug and precise fits there. Random variations to, this, to the parts of the puzzle will cause it not to work anymore. This, is, this reminds me of this EZH protein that's part of the polycomb repressive complex two, this EZH2 protein. And it really does, you know, this God-made protein, very so as sophisticated as it is, it does remind me in passing of the man-made toy. So we have man-made puzzles and God-made puzzles. And if only to uh, drive the point home further, the EZH2 protein is part of a much larger complex of proteins and uh, DNAs and RNAs, it's incredible. This complex is called the PRC2, uh, the polycomb repressive complex two. It enables uh, the skin to, to be differentiated. So the quality of your skin at the soles of your feet are different than the quality of your skin in your eyelids and it changes a single molecule. Variations geometrically to this will ruin the connecting parts and hence ruin the system. That's why most random mutations to uh, critical regions of proteins will generally be detrimental. Uh, so just random variations in general, at best they'll be hopefully uh, of neutral effect and most likely they will be detrimental. So this is the reason why most variations in proteins are damaging. And so these are reasons why I believe that there are independent origins for the major protein families. They have to appear just right, and, and, and hence we have an orchard. This is consistent with the same conclusion Dr. Dan had of independent origins. He probably arrived this at different ways. Based on my conversations with him, it would be a bioinformatic thing, and I'm gonna introduce that now. Oh, okay, moderator, are, are we doing okay on time here? Uh, you're not Danny, you're Marcus Ross. Anyway, we're doing okay. All right, let's, let's proceed then. Collagens account for around 25% of the protein mass in our bodies. Uh, you can buy collagen supplements at Walgreens, for example, to supplement your own collagen to make you look very beautiful. Collagen, like all proteins, is made of amino acids. Uh, 
and uh, these are just the chemical diagrams for the amino acids. We can represent the amino acids uh, by English alphabetical letters, like say A for the amino acid alanine, R for the amino acid arginine, et cetera, et cetera. If we take, um, if we take the, the protein collagen, really strictly speaking, it's the polypeptide, and after it's translated, it's just one long polymer, like one long string. I've taken the liberty to uh, wrap it around the spelling of this, and this is the spelling of the collagen uh, alpha, alpha uh, type, type one collagen alpha one paralog. Now, do you see a uh, non-random pattern in the spelling? There it is. There's a segment of the collagen polypeptide or protein that every third amino acid is a G, G for glycine. And that is a signature characteristic of collagen, this, this non-random pattern. So file that away for now while we look at the human's ZNF-136 crab zinc finger protein. This one's 540 amino acids. The other one was 1,464. And there's a non-random pattern here. Every row here with the colorings is a what they call a zinc finger domain, where you have the Cs that represent cysteines and the H for histidines. Each row has a zinc ion connecting to those specific amino acids. It has to be spaced just like this for this protein to work. And you need several of these rows to, to enable the zinc finger to work. There are higher order patterns uh, that we don't need to go into right now. Uh, but the point is, hopefully visually you could see that it's unreasonable to even conceptually think of what a common ancestor to these two would be in terms of the spelling. And the spelling is very important to function. So it's either gonna, you know, what that ancestor is, it's gonna be bad at what it does if it tries to evolve into collagen or it tries to evolve in a zinc finger, or if we try to take a collagen and evolve it into a zinc finger or vice versa, that's not going to work. So this echoes again the idea of independent common ancestry is the reasonable outcome. And this is the line of reasoning that uh, Dr. Dan was uh, articulating to me. So now we're in the final stretch of the talk. Uh, Notice the no smoking sign and fasten your seat belts because we're gonna go into some tough territory. Molecular biophysics, statistical mechanics, thermodynamics, information theory, bioinformatics, and origin of proteins. This part of the talk was not in my original talk um, when I was writing it, but then after hearing Andy McIntosh and John Baumgartner, I felt I needed to weigh in and I promised Andy I'd include this in my presentation today here at the Creation Research Society. So, thermodynamics, statistical mechanics. <clears throat> These are the opening sentences of an excellent textbook, States of Matter, 1975, by David L. Goodstein. He says, Ludwig Boltzmann, Ludwig Boltzmann, who spent most of his life, who spent most of his life studying statistical mechanics and thermodynamics died in 1906 by his own hand. Paul Ehrenfest, carrying on the work, died similarly in 1933. Now it is our turn to study statistical mechanics. So we start with the concept of entropy. Entropy is not like anything in human experience, everyday human experience. For example, we can sense, we can, we can definitely sense temperature. We can sense if something's heavier or lighter than something else. We can perceive length. We can perceive time, uh, et cetera. But how do you perceive entropy? It doesn't accord with anything in our, uh, you know, ordinary everyday experience. It is a mathematical abstraction. And one of the first people to codify its meaning, at least indirectly, was Rudolf Clausius. And 
he used this thing called the, now known as the Clausius integral, where S represents entropy. And the way this works is one can take a calorimeter, which measures heat, and a thermometer, plug it into Clausius's equation, and you can calculate change in entropy, delta S. And that was useful for building steam engines. Later on, Ludwig Boltzmann came up with his definition of entropy, where S is entropy, KB is Boltzmann's constant, and W is the number of molecular or atomic microstates. And that's a very complicated topic. We don't need to go into detail about that. But suffice to say, Boltzmann was very brave to do this because at the time, a lot of people didn't even believe atoms existed. So he postulated the existence of atoms and said, if you have a system of atoms, you're gonna have these things called microstates, which are the configurations of the atom in the, system, in the thermodynamic system. And you can count, you can estimate the count of these, and this is related to the entropy. Uh, the numbers involved are just astronomically big, even for a trivially small, like say ice cube, the, the number of microstates is just enormous. But why am I going into this? Well, it shows that we can take calorimeters that give you Q and thermometers that give you T and through Clausius and then Clausius connects to Boltzmann, we can then peer into the molecular details of these invisible worlds using calorimeters and thermometers. We can kind of guess the structure of the molecular structure of these invisible realms that are too tiny for us to see. And a great example of that was Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling estimating the structure of ice and confirming it with calorimeters and thermometers. Uh, that was a great paper on configurational entropy. And then we can also estimate properties about DNA using this. So you look at this connection and all the work that it took. If you ever go through the math, it's just insane. Yes, it's insanity, it's also genius. And as I pondered this, it reminded me of this quote, there is no great genius without a tinge of insanity. And well, it, I'm trying to make you crazy today so that I could turn you into geniuses, or at least you'll feel that way at the end of this talk, by the end of this talk. Yesterday, Dr. Andy McIntosh talked about the Gibbs free energy. In, in relation to the origin of life and information theory. Let me just kind of boil this down to more everyday considerations. If we had information like God's eternal word and we wanted to make a copy of it in the English translation, we would have this, we could consider doing this with a Gutenberg press. And you would take, you take this press and you take ink and paper, you'd organize the ink onto the paper we can, we can consider this as an investment, um, the investment of investing energy to make that organized system of ink and paper. There's energy expended in the, fume, uh, in the form of human mechanical energy to do this. Now I did a back of the envelope calculation and you'll, I'll actually specifically mention bits here. So we have roughly 3,116,480 characters in an English Bible. I'm presuming that's King James. I don't know specifically if it is. There's seven, about seven, eight bits of information per character. I'll go with seven bits. The English Bible has around 21,815,360,000 bits of Shannon information. So that's basically multiplying seven by the, the three million figure up there. The human genome has three gigabases and 6.6 .6 gigabits. Therefore, the human genome can hold around 300 copies of the English Bible. So let's say we're trying to, quote unquote, organize the DNA molecules such that we effectively print the Bible onto DNA, where we're using DNA as an alphabet. People have tried to do something similar to this on a much smaller scale. But the point is energy has to be invested. There has to be an investment of energy to accomplish this transformation. And we can roughly call it, the minimum energy would be the Gibbs free energy. And this 
relates to the work of Ralph Landauer. He was a physicist for IBM. And obviously IBM is interested in the amount of energy, which relate to electric bills, et cetera, uh, that it takes to uh, uh, change the status of a system to flip bits. And Landauer calculated that physics will not allow you to have, it, it will absolutely require a cost of at least 0 0.175 175 electron volts at 20 degrees Celsius. Usually the cost of storing bits or processing is gonna be way more, but he calculated that you're not gonna be able to get around this free energy cost. And this does relate uh, to your electric bill in terms of kilowatt hours to the operation of your computer. And this then leads to things in life. So this is why we had to go through this, you keep hearing this torturous journey through thermodynamics eventually relating it to the energy of forming the first complex uh, macromolecules of life. I, <clears throat> I, I independently, I tried to show that there's an independent confirmation of Landauer's principle in stereochemistry where we organize amino acids uh, from the racemic state into the homochiral state, which makes life possible, which makes life possible with stable, life is possible because of stable protein folds because of the homochirality. And there is a free energy associated with this, just like putting ink and paper on, uh, on paper to make a Bible, uh, to, to make it usable. So too, we have to organize the quote unquote bits of life in their physical structure to make them usable. And this make, means making, um, in, in organizing the proteins to be made of homochiral left-handed amino acids. And the Gibbs free energy that I calculated using the Landauer principle is within 20% agreement with this one in the stereochemistry book. Uh, if I were to work with Dr. McIntosh on this, uh, we, we talked about writing a paper together on, on this topic. And we'd probably have to resolve that 20% discrepancy, which I can't account for at this time. But let's say hypothetically, uh, rather than DNA, let's do something easier, at least conceptually for me, of uh, printing out a, uh, the Bible using amino acids instead of nucleic acids in DNA. Amino acids, and we're just gonna make one big polypeptide polymer. So just hypothetically imagine this where we have, uh, where we represent zero with a left-handed amino acid and one with a right-handed. We could then form a polymer that is basically zeros and ones using amino acids. Landauer and uh, the, this book on stereochemistry then would describe the, the Gibbs free energy required to make such a printing, quote unquote, the Bible possible, possible. So this related to a discussion between John Baumgartner and Andy McIntosh yesterday. Uh, we can calculate, you know, Andy McIntosh talked about this in uh, uh, relating to DNA. If he and I do a paper together, we would need to calculate the Gibbs free energy using Landauer's principle for DNA. Um, instead of amino acids. And I don't, to my knowledge, no one has done that calculation. So kind of wrapping up the, the presentation, despite the Einstein gap that Dr. Baumgartner met, mentioned yesterday, the divide between the material and non-material realms, that's the Einstein gap, the Landauer principle demonstrates an energetic relationship between representations of spiritual things in the physical world. Now, th this isn't meant to be too, you know, this isn't meant to be uh, too esoteric. It's actually kind of mundane. So we have the Bible, which is God's word, in, in you know, that abides forever. In, in a sense, it's non-material. But if we're gonna make copies of it in the English language, we have to put it in physical mediums like uh, ink and paper. And so there, the Landauer principle then relates to where we have these conceptual bits, how much, how much energy will it take to actually realize it in physical media? 
And so this relates to the origin of life problem. And um, not, you know, I'm not going to re recapitulate what Dr. McIntosh said yesterday, but his conclusion when you analyze this, that it all at least to conclude that life is a miracle because there's not a coupling mechanism that will take available energy and organize it um, to the levels of free energy th that are needed that are associated with that with that structure. So you can have energy and dynamite, but you need something like Gutenberg's press or a modern day printing press to print out Bibles. So you could have an atomic bomb explode it's, unless it's coupled to another uh, means of organizing that energy. Uh, it's just not going to incorporate that free energy. So the problem is what's the coupling mechanism that's going to take available energy and then make it free energy of the system in these quote unquote informed systems. So before we go to the question and answer, um, let me make some acknowledgements. Uh, but first, this idea of the physical being connected, the spiritual being, the immaterial being connected to the physical world, it reminds me of this verse in Romans, his invisible attributes, his divine nature and eternal power are clearly seen in the things that are made. And before the question and answer, I'd like to make some acknowledgments. I'd like to acknowledge Walter Remine, who wrote the biotic message. He's the co-founder of Bear Monology and uh, Discontinuity Systematics, the idea of kind of disconnected parts, independent origins that inspired this talk today. I'd like to uh, recognize the co-author of this presentation in Henry Wittler. He helped, he and I are working on a paper on protein complexity, and he also helped with the insulin receptor. Another co-author, well, this is the co-author's invention, John Sanford. This invention by John Sanford is in the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, because uh, through this invention, Billions of starving billions were fed as, as crop yields were increased through the gene gun by genetic improvement. Dr. Sanford also co-authored a article with Bill Basner in the Journal of Mathematical Biology. That article set records by large margin, like say 400% of any other article in the journal's history uh, in terms of the number of downloads. This, this led to him being invited to speak at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Sanford is a young earth creationist. He used to be an atheist. He became a Christian, then a young earth creationist. When he spoke at the National Institutes of Health, it caused a scandal, but he certainly, uh, no doubt, earned the right to be heard given his accomplishments as a research professor at Cornell. Now, as a little bit of an anecdote about Dr. Sanford, um, some of you know that my mother, uh, I had taken care of her for 18 years after my father died. I left my job as a as an engineer and scientist in the aerospace and defense industry to take care of her. Dr. Sanford gave me a job so I could work from home and take care of my mother. And um, another funny anecdote about uh, Dr. Sanford is after his talk at the NIH, he came over to stay at my house for a couple of days. And when he arrived, he said, Sal, can I mow the lawn? And I was thinking to myself, uh, Dr. Sanford, you're my boss. I can't let you mow the lawn. But I said, sure, John, go ahead. And so he mowed the lawn. And I think that's because of his background as a landscaper. He loves gardening. And he said, hey, Sal, can I, can I, help, uh, can I help garden? Can I, can I help, uh, you know, make your make your mother's garden look beautiful, and he did. And so that's in our family album where uh, Dr. Sanford, myself, and my mom were out in the garden, and, uh, and, and he was working on it. All this to say what an outstanding Christian gentleman he is, an example for the next generation. I'd also like, <clears throat> uh, oh yeah, I'll point out that I had, uh, I had the privilege of being a co-author with Dr. Sanford and a Springer Nature chapter 
in a Springer Nature Reference work, a handbook of the mathematics of the arts and sciences. It was critical of evolutionary theory, but it is now on the university cell shelves, the shelves of universities that are secular universities. You can find it in some of your schools. So, you, you know, cre creation is, is slowly getting a beachhead into secular universities just because you can't, you can't fight the truth. Uh, just for grins, you can buy it if you want, uh, $1,500 from Springer Nature, but don't buy it because I don't get a dime from it. And if you wanted a discount, you can you can get it at Walmart for 819. I should also mention I, I talked about uh, Joe Deweese. Uh, David Reeves here had made a documentary on Joe Deweese uh, and the Topai Som races. So there you go, uh, David. Some free advertising. You can send me a check later. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Job Martin and his family. This last year they. Um, you know, my mother went home to be with the Lord last year and Dr. Martin's message, the storms of life and the, the, the care and, and love of his family helped me get through the last year. Also in 2004, at a talk at University of Virginia, Dr. Martin made the call to all the people there, the young people there to consider being scientists, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ by being a scientist. He's the only evangelist I know that encouraged people to be scientists, not just missionaries or preachers, but scientists. And I'd like to extend my thanks to him. And finally, most important of all, I'd like to acknowledge my Lord and Savior, our Creator, Jesus Christ. Thank you. So now on to the Q&A. And since... Um, uh, I'm going to suggest some questions uh, that we could, that I can take if you can't think of any. So, Anne, um, we could ask me about bent pencils and geocentrism. Okay, Anne, we'll we'll talk about that. Bent pencils and geocentrism. So this is the philosophical detour. We have a uh, we have a straight pencil that when it's dipped in water, it looks bent. We have a straight pencil that when it is dipped in water, it looks bent. And this reminds us of evolutionary, reminds me of how when we look at life, it may look evolved. Um, but on further study, we realize it's created. A more powerful, ex uh, and this, by the way, it took thousands of years to figure this out. Willibord Snell codified the reasons in what's known as Snell's Law. More powerfully, we had the problem of the appearance of geocentrism. That is the idea that the entire universe revolves around the Earth. Now, this theory was actually really good. I mean, it lasted. We were able to make calendars, predict seasons, et cetera, et cetera. Superficially, it looked right because the sun rises and sets every day. So, you know, one would assume this is correct. There are a few minor problems, like, say, retrograde motion. And, and that was its undoing. One little anomaly uh, just broke this apart. And this, the real model, the correct model is heliocentrism, where the Earth and planets orbit the sun, the moon orbits the Earth, and the Earth rotates. So reality is more complex than the superficial viewpoint. Why am I bringing this up? And you'll see it. Stephen Gould asked, did he, that is God, create to mimic evolution and test our faith thereby? He's basically saying, if you look at biology in the world around us, it looks like life arose through a process of natural evolution, that there's no need of God. And he said, did, did God create it to look that way and test our faith thereby, uh, thereby? And I will counter and say, well, did, did God create Snell's law to deceive us that the pencils are bent when they're really straight? Or did God create 
the, the motions of the planet to deceive us that the earth is geo you know the earth is the center of the universe and that the correct that the model is geocentric for our universe and i'd say no because he also did provide enough data to, so that you could deduce what the truth is the truth is that the pencil is straight and the truth is the earth is not the center of the universe what you have to do is to explore all the data points in further detail and you'll see the truth and you will not be deceived. So how does this relate to biology? On the left is a uh, human zinc finger, 136. On the right is the pig's zinc finger, 136. You can see they're structurally similar in using the colors. And, um, you know, the algorithm will predict this is 50 to 60% sequence similarity, depending on the scoring technique. And so a creationist growing up in a Christian home goes off to college. Uh, he's excited that he's going to defend creationism. He goes and he studies this in class. And you're like, oh, my goodness, uh, the human protein looks a lot like the pigs. Uh, this seems like common descent is true. So just hold that thought for a little bit. We can take other species in addition to pigs and, and put other species, their sequences in a computer. You can build these like tree of life type things and evolution look very powerfully demonstrated. But hold that thought. Remember the bent pencil in geocentrism. What it superficially looks like isn't necessarily what it is. Likewise, we could do the same for collagen. On, 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 on the left is human collagen. On the right is zebra fish collagen. They're 75% similar, roughly. And it, when we take other species and, and arrange these uh, in terms of similarity, you get these phy phylogenetic trees. Looks like the tree of life. It looks like common descent is definitely proven. Uh, but again, I'd remind you what it looks like isn't necessarily what it is. The first thing to consider is that the proteins themselves do not have a common ancestor. The proteins themselves do not have a common ancestor. Even evolutionary biologists will admit it. So even if we assume common descent, one has to assume miracles of special creation to make it possible. Therefore, evolution needs miracles to make it work. Why not just be a creationist at that point? Furthermore, if we're able to scientifically demonstrate that life, or even better, the, the earth is young, then as a matter of principle, there is no universal common ancestry. There's just not enough time. And the rest of the Creation Research Society studies this. Okay, so now the next question. Um, yeah, this, this was, why do we look so similar to chimps? Um, and what accounts for the diff patterns of similarity and diversity. So uh, I just should mention this, you can transplant human topoisome race into yeast, but not the reverse. Uh, so there is optimization for the species, uh, definitely in some cases, particularly for complex organisms like humans, there's this thing called hy uh, hydropathic optimization and the post-translational modification and specialized moonlighting no time to get into that. But let me just back up a little bit. Considering it, what if you didn't have these creatures like chimpanzees or pigs that were similar to us? How would we do, how, how could we possibly do, let me pause here a little bit. How could we possibly do medical research? You'd have to dissect and open up other human beings. Uh, up here is a fetal pig. Do you want to take a, a fetal, a human fetus and do this? That, that, that's reprehensible morally. And, and there are all these cruel experiments and I realized when I was at the NIH and I had to do uh, work, uh, I was doing a report on um, a particular receptor on a, uh, on, on a neuron. And I asked the postdoctoral researcher who was assigned to help me on my presentation. I said, where, where did we get these cells? He said, they're embryonic stem cells. My heart sank. I went home, looked it up. These were embryonic stem cells taken from an aborted fetus. And then it dawned on me, you know, this doesn't have to be this way. We have creatures, these primates, 
that are very similar to us, they can die. We can kill their fetuses. Okay, I know that sounds gross and cruel, but a lot of medical research is made possible because we have what we call model organisms. And what that means is when we try to find out about human biology, we have this spectrum of creatures from simple to very complex, from very dissimilar to similar. And it's great that we can do experiments on these other creatures so that we could understand ourselves, so that we can understand our own biology. And it is as if God, this echoes what we have in the Old Testament where innocent creatures died so that our sins would be atoned for and that we could be healed. It says in the Bible, by his stripes, we are healed. Uh, obviously those pictures in the Old Testament sacrifices are uh, the picture of the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And so we have in biology, these innocent creatures that look like us that are there to help us understand our own biology. Biology is optimized to help understand human biology. And that's why there's a pattern of similarity. That's why we have creatures like the chimpanzee that are very similar to us. And to drive the point home even farther, this relates to Todd Wood's question, why are there sequence differences between the various creatures? Like I showed you the one with, the, let's see if I have it here, the, the one, the collagen between like say the, um, get it here between the human and zebrafish and Todd Wood in 2012 put this on the table it's like I don't know why God would spell it different and and the answer I'll suggest is that there's a hidden code here and part of the work I have done with Joe Deweese is to uh, is to show this hidden code there, there are other people that have done work before us, very excellent work uh, on algorithms called like DCA and alpha fold. You take like a topoisomerase across species, you pump it through this algorithm of alpha fold, and it will describe the three dimensional shape of proteins. This is like voodoo. Think how hard it is to make a coding system that is self-revealing, that is self-decoding, that can take two, you know, just basically sequences, and then it's gonna describe a 3D architecture. The math that implements this is brutally hard. You can look it up in Wikipedia, look up direct coupling analysis. And so the, the reason for the patterns of similarity and diversity is, is it's optimized for scientific discovery, particularly to help us understand human biology. And so that was my answer to Todd Wood's question. Why did God make these patterns of similarity, similarity and diversity in the genes proteins in terms of their sequence? That was 2012. My answer in 2022 is steganography or organisms as oracles, which is basically what I was describing with this computation. And so what looks evolved is actually created. <sighs> okay, so thank you. That was my presentation with questions and answers. So those, what had happened was my presentation was so long I, and I had all these time limits I said, I have to be clever about this. What I'll do is I'll cut out the pieces that will make me go over limit and I'll just save it for the question and answers. And just to kind of help the process that I get to cover it, I suggested the questions that they asked. And it's really funny. Um, when I finished my presentation, no one wanted to ask any questions. And people were saying, well, Sal, that was so clear. I mean, afterward they gave me feedback and they said it was so clear. That's why we didn't have any questions to ask, it was actually really good. I suggested some questions they should ask me and I was able to finish my presentation. So Ben Rex, I noticed greetings Ben Rex and everyone else, uh, Mats and Ben Rex and Schnoil. So let me just acknowledge you and Mats 
and Ben Rex. So someone was, uh, yeah, imagine people asking questions to Sal and Sal just continues with his own questions and answers. That's actually what happened. That was, uh, that was by, you know, I kind of lucked out because I really wanted to present more of my stuff. So I just suggested these questions and people, I said, just, you know, I, I said, uh, I said, it's a question buffet. You can come up with your own questions or I could suggest these three and they covered all three. They wanted me to cover all three of these questions. So, um, and Ben Rex said, I thought this was a re-upload, not a, well, it's easier sometimes to just do a live stream to record and I can kind of debrief what happened. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I remember some of the people that were asking questions like Ann Habermill and Marcus Ross, Dr. Mark Horstemeyer. Um, and they're, you know, they were asking some, what you heard is very close to the way I delivered it on Saturday. It just kept replaying in my mind when I was on my drive back home. So that's why I do remember the details. That's also why I wanted to record this so quickly after the conference while it's still fresh in my memory, what happened. And um, so you'll notice this is very different than my very, very first version of this. I added a lot of stuff because, partly because there was stuff covered in the first day uh, that I felt would be nice to incorporate in this talk. And so um, I did put in the Landauer stuff. Now, Ben Rex asked, this seemed a lot longer than the earlier versions, I had to talk really fast and I was a lot more forceful. Uh, but, you know, when I'm on camera, I have, I, you know, I, I wanted to articulate things and just slow down. So I added a few things to elaborate in this talk. You know, my audience are professors. I could use some ter terminology and I could skip some things. I, I elaborated a little bit more in this discussion because I did, since it's being recorded uh, for the public and people might refer to it, I want them to have it. So uh, this summarized a good portion of stuff that was, um, that I actually worked on the last seven years with Dr. Dr. Sanford, the problem of protein complexity. So I really wanted to highlight the importance of geometry. And you can see, the problem geometry poses in the interconnectivity. Now we have a means of really arguing why proteins are so astronomically improbable. It's not something esoteric anymore. You can actually see it. Um, and, and yeah, so that was, that's probably the big breakthrough for me is that I could see the connection of the spelling of the pro protein with the shape of the protein. And, and even though we, even today, we don't exactly know like if I said you wanted to shape, make a protein shape this way, we actually wouldn't know how to do this computationally to say, okay, we don't know for one, whether it can even adopt that shape. And even if it could, we don't know how to make the spelling to adopt that shape. That's the protein folding problem. But it is even at this point in our limited technology, we know enough to say that if you change the spelling in critical parts and you have a shape that is functional and connects, you can't just randomly just chop it to pieces and expect it to still be functioning in its role. Now, what ends up happening is the evolutionary biologist will cite these proteins that just kind of float out in isolation and do catalytic activity by themselves. And they say, see, you could kind of change it. You could change the catalytic activity. There's not, so, you know, it's not so sensitive to mutation. And it's like, okay, you know, that's a bit of confirmation bias. You're, you're really more cherry picking. You're cherry picking the examples where you can mutate it and there's not like adverse consequences. You take something like topoisomerase, their positions there, if you remove them, one single amino acid, you're gonna kill the protein. So that's not true of every position on the topoisomerase, but they're definitely positions. You wipe that out, you wipe out the whole protein. And if it's not wiping it out, there are a lot of positions, if you mutate them, it's gonna compromise from a geometric perspective, therefore it compromises its function. So now let me uh, just look through here. Um, so you can kind of consider that this is kind of the after, you know, the after talk of the uh, presentation. I really wanna thank everyone that has watched all the versions of my presentation evolve. This is now really basically the seventh or eighth, and this is the final 
I'm representing, this is the final version. So uh, th thank you for the kind words. Schnoil. Certain features of biology, ERV is top of the list, don't reflect the analogy of the bent pencil at all. I'd be curious about which features stick out the most to sell, which don't fit the pattern. Um, ERVs actually, they look very designed to me because of developments in the last year. So they did look kind of accidental for a long time, like a lot of stuff in the DNA, but we're finding out things like um, phase separation. A lot of the transcribed RNAs, they have biophysical properties. What I mean by that, okay, if you take oil, drop it in a cup of water, you see it kind of clumps up. Well, the sequence in the cell of an RNA, when it connects to a protein, it will have a certain density. It's like a submarine. It'll position it in a certain place in the cell. So the spelling of the sequence is important for the RNA to make these membrane-less organelles. There are all these little organelles throughout the cell. And so what they thought was junk is now a functional part of having all these organelles. We're only beginning to figure out what those organelles do. We thought it's just junk that never gets out of the nucleus and, and it doesn't do anything. <laughs> We're learning very fast. I happen to be thankfully connected to some of the researchers that are on the cutting edge of this research. That's why I knew about it, this, this uh, phase separation thing. And there are all sorts of other things. Uh, I don't know if I really answered your question, Matt. Um, if I misfired, feel free to ask again. And, oh, it was Schnoil. I'm sorry, Ben Rex, it was Schnoil who asked. I'd like to thank everyone for joining. And so with that, and it's great to see some people uh, here on the other side of the Atlantic, the other side of the pond, joining the stream. Um, and yeah, Peter says, in some claim there is no God. We see his invisible attributes, his divine nature, eternal power through the things that are made. So uh, let me now try to close up the stream. Uh, and Ben Rick says, and some claim there are multiple gods. Well, you see that pattern at the end that I called steganography? There had to be one God that made all the creatures. Um, there had to be a God that made the, all the creatures to coordinate that code. That's what I would say that that point, rather than multiple designers, which is a reasonable hypothesis that indicates a single designer. And Matt said, I think so. I'm troubled at the need to find function as the final explanation when the bent pencil analogy is not really about a functional explanation. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, there's okay. So the creationist ID proponents would like to see function. That's reassuring. But what's driving the search for function is actually the medical community. They're trying to find out the causes and reasons for disease. 90% of the heritable, I mean, 90% of diseases that are associated with DNA are found in the non-coding regions. That's what actually drove this. And it's it just a byproduct of that is the ID proponents and creationists were just thrilled to see this because it made the evolutionary biologists look really bad. We've been saying for decades that this is junk, that it's incompetent. And what we're seeing is this exquisite design that we, it's unparalleled. We have nothing like this in our technology that we could do this. So um, anyway, thank you, Ben Rex. And uh, sorry, I didn't recognize the joke. Uh, so I'm gonna wrap up the stream uh, with some Rachmaninoff. Take care, uh, everyone, and may the Lord, our Lord, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, richly bless you.